Well, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Jeff Bentley and welcome to the RTB Seed Systems Toolbox Seminar. This is day two of three. Today is Peruvian Independence Day. So today and tomorrow are national holidays in Peru. So we just want to say a word of appreciation to all of our ICT colleagues in Lima who are making today happen for us. So thank you all very much. We couldn't do it without you. Today we have four sessions, seed tracing, INA, cassava uh, seed tracker, and experimental auctions. So just to, let's take just a moment to review the rules of the game. So your video cameras and microphones are turned off. You can't turn them on. Uh, the session is being recorded. So you can leave questions in the chat. And please use the Q&A button to ask questions. We have simultaneous translation from English to Spanish and from English to French. So use the button at the bottom of the screen to select the language that you would like to listen to. So during the uh, presentations, you may uh, write in a question in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You don't have to wait until the uh, speaker, until the presentation is, is over. So uh, please just leave questions there in the Q&A and not in the chat. And then the presenter will answer those questions during the Q&A session. And uh, if they can't answer all of your questions out loud, they'll make an effort to answer them in writing. And there will be a little uh, proceedings paper uh, next, uh, well, soon, coming soon, which will have the questions and the answers in them as well. So today we're going to start by listening to Connie Almekinders. She is one of the leaders of this toolbox initiative, and she is going to review uh, yesterday's sessions and uh, lead us into uh, today. So Connie, over to you. I'll try to do something like what you uh, just announced. Um, with the help of somebody who moved the slides of my PowerPoint presentation because I couldn't get the share screen done the way I uh, wanted. So the person who uh, will react on my next slide, please, please beware that there is some animation. So when I say next, it might also be that something appears in the same slide. Don't panic and do two times next because then I'm panicking. Anyhow, um, Good to see that we have so many participants again. Um, we were really, really gladly surprised yesterday with all the interest from the field. Um, well, most of you must have been attending yesterday's presentation, but maybe not all of you. In any case, the small introduction that I prepared is to uh, bring you up to speed and so it'll be some sort of a recap, but also an orientation of today for today's program. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll start again. Um, on the first day, Margaret McEwen in her introduction um, of the course um, already explained that seed systems are complex things. Um, they have different characteristics for different type of crops and in different contexts. And RTB crops in particular, these vegetatively propagated crops have this problem of seeds. I mean, the roots, the stems, the suckers, the tubers, that they are bulky and perishable, which makes them again, especially vulnerable to different pest and disease. So a lot of research needed in these systems to make them work better. And this research is all types of research with different disciplinary angles. So it's agronomy, it is uh, economics, it's plant breeding, pathologists, and all these different disciplines are there. And as many of you know, researchers tend to like to work in their own bubble. Yeah, they try to make silos because then they're less bothered with other disciplinaries and thinkings that just sit in the way. 
Um, now, uh, the RTB SEEP system group in that sense um, is a quite unique group. We became a quite unique group because we decided that we wanted to find the connection between each other, between these different disciplines and between these different tools and methods. So we set out to develop an interdisciplinary type of work. And that disciplinary, interdisciplinary character is reflected in the tools of the toolbox. And yes, now the animation in, please, next. The, these are the interdisciplinary tools in the toolbox. And because of this interdisciplinary nature, they are both qualitative and quantitatively oriented tools and mixes thereof. And I'll come back to that. Um, next slide, please. Here you see a schematic uh, presentation of the seed system, and you've seen it before, and some of you know it as the seed value chain. This animation that comes in now with the blue stars were the tools that you got presented on day one. Yeah, there was number one the multi-stakeholder framework. And you see that the bar is, is spanning um, the whole um, seed value chain. So it looks at the entire seed value chain. Um, and the other um, tools that we had on day one were number six, seven, and eight. And they focused more on the part what is in the seed value chain, the part where farmers, to use and choose seeds and varieties. So the small and exploratory case study, the four square method, the means and change um, are blocks that looking at that particular part of the seed value chain. Um, I want to come back to this interdisciplinary nature of these tools. You see now the animation that came in and it says the multi-stakeholder framework is largely a qualitative tool, meaning that the information that is collected with the multi-stakeholder framework is, yeah, principally written words, yeah? It is the information, it is the knowledge of stakeholders about what they know about the seed value chain, uh, and about their perspectives on what are challenges and opportunities to improve the seed system. Yeah. Whereas the other tools, six, seven, and eight, are tools that are much more of a mixed nature. They are tools that collect both quantitative type of information and qualitative type of information. So both numbers and words. And that's why these tools have become to know, um, they are generally referred to as mixed method tools, right? Um, let me see. Now, what I also wanted to mention is that, um, yeah, we realized based on the questions on the first day that many of you have have been trained in the use of quantitative tools. It's still the most dominating um, type of research going on. And you might not be so familiar with the qualitative um, tools where actually the rules of the game are somewhat different. You know, they are not the type of tools that usually use statistical um, analysis and things like sampling biases and representativeness are different than when you use quantitative tools. So the qualitative tool, the wordy ones, um, have a kind of different rules of the game as the quantitative ones, whereas the numbers and statistics are dominating. Um, it goes a bit, it's not the place to further elaborate on it, but we wanted to come back to this because of the questions that were raised on the first day. And actually, um, it made us realize that we should keep in mind how unique our tools are and that not everybody is um, so aware of it unless we start to point it out. And so therefore, this small addition. 
actually what I wanted to say as well is we had these same difficulties with blending the quantitative and the qualitative when we started developing these tools eight years ago because we came together as you know uh, researchers from our own discipline and then wanting to blend these tools and mix them so um, we actually have forgotten how unique it might be or how special it is that we're starting to play around with do tools from different disciplines and and methodologies good Back to the program. Um, in the meantime, um, more uh, stars have appeared. And what we're going to do today is present you with the tools indicated with the red stars. Um, there's first of all, um, the red star with the number nine, which is the experimental auction. And that's the last tool that we will present today. But it's also a tool that actually light number six, seven, and eight, looks into what farmers um, like to choose and what they like to pay for and how much they like to pay for in terms of varieties and seeds. And um, coming back to this quantitative qualitative issue, experimental auctions is, I would say, principally a quantitative tool. It works with numbers, but there is space to, to modify and make it somewhat more qualitative. And the other three tools that we're going to present to you today are two, three, and five, being impact network analysis, seed tracker, and seed tracing. And tomorrow, um, we have another set of tools, which are the green stars. So next slide, please. I hope this didn't go too fast for the interpreters. That might actually have been a bit more. Hello, Connie. This is Nathan. I'm here to remind you that we're running out on time, so you could wrap up in the next two minutes. Thank you. Okay, I'll try to do that. If someone gives me um, an, an... Ah, yeah, this is the next slide. One more thing on this figure. You see that these tools have different spans over the seed value chains, and that means that they give you an understanding of particular parts of the value chain. Now, that can I go back? Oh, here it is again. Um, this allows you to, to, to also figure out, hey, when I want to understand this part of the value chain, which tool and which tools could I use? How could I combine different tools to arrive at the understanding or answers that I have with particular aspects of the seed value chain? So this is an entry point to the use of the tools in the toolbox. Next slide. Because this is the other entry point where you may ask similar things. Hey, I'm in an implementation phase. So what are, are the logical tools to use for what I want to achieve, what I want to know? Or maybe I have questions about the seed system and you know maybe I should look more at it from a diagnostic phase onwards and then see which tools suit me and how I can combine them. Next slide, please. So here um, we had um, workshop one. Um, here we are in workshop one, and we're actually now on July 29, and we're in the presentation of these tools. Yeah. Um, what I just said about the combination of different tools is especially useful um, and, and relevant. Can I have the next slide, please? For those who also engage with us in the field work, backward, please who engage with us in the field work in August and September, because this combination of tools may exactly lead you to the combination of tools that you're gonna apply in the field um, with, with support from us. But I also invite the rest of the audience to please think through what in your situation with your team and your project are the relevant aspects of the seed value chain or in your project that you would like to get um, understanding about and which type of combination of tools would suit you. Okay, next slide. Um, hi, this Colleen. is the last one. Okay. This is actually to say, okay, for today, uh, please, if you haven't visited the website, go and see the website one more time. Um, think about the seed system aspects that you're interested in and please share your question and answers again after the presentation of each tools. 
Now, sorry for having been delayed a bit. Jeff, back to you. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Connie. Um, so we're going to move to our first presentation today. We're going to hear again from Fleur Kilwinger. Uh, she's going to talk to us about seed tracing. Fleur is a PhD candidate at Wageningen. So take it away, Fleur. Hello, everyone. My name is Fleur Kilwinger, and welcome to this introduction video to seed tracing. Seed tracing can be used to map seed flows or information flows or diseases and so on in a network. And it also forms the minimum data set of an impact network analysis. Seed tracing study can be conducted on several levels. It can be done regionally or countrywide, or it can even map seed flows between countries. And the users are um, seed intervention designers, implementers, evaluators, analysts, or indeed people that want to conduct an impact network analysis. The output that you get is a quantitative understanding of the links between key actors in a seed system. And the audience is quite similar to the users, and it can also be used by policymakers, lobbyists, or donors. So about the minimum sample size for a seed tracing study, um, what the tool does is identify links between actors in a system. And a link can already be established between a minimum of two actors, but the more links that you identify, the more accurate your overview of the seed system becomes. Um, seed tracing studies that give a meaningful result and are still feasible are usually involving around 50 to 500 respondents. Um, the smaller sample sizes can cover a small area, whereas the larger your sample size, then it also becomes meaningful for a larger area or maybe um, to do a survey across borders. The number of people that are needed for a seed tracing study really depend on the sample size and the size of the study area. So for a small study, um, one or two people might be enough, but the number needs to be increased if the study area is very big or the sample size is very large. Um, the easiest to collect the data is via a digital survey tool. Um, Further, what is needed is transport to move from one actor to the other. And to analyze your data, you need Excel or RStudio software. The further expertise that is needed is that the enumerators collecting the data must speak the local language and understand key agronomic terms. Um, the researchers who analyze the data should know how to process network data and have some knowledge of Excel or RStudio. And um, if the seed tracing is used for an impact network analysis, then data should be entered in R and the people analyzing the data should have a good understanding of RStudio. In theory, you could conduct a seed tracing study at any time, but it it's best to not conduct a survey in the middle of sourcing time because yeah, you can imagine maybe some farmers already have their material for this season, other are still looking. So you will get a bit of a skewed image if you ask this information in the middle of sourcing time or you will really have to record from the beginning to the end so that it really is your main data collection time frame and make sure you capture all the information. Um, also, farmers should be able to remember where they source the seed, so asking questions about too long ago or a too big time window um, it won't work. Um, yeah, so if they are used at the start of the project, they can give an overview of the seed system where maybe an intervention is made, or they can also be used afterwards to see um, how successful intervention has been. 
How long a seed tracing study will take really depends on the sample size and the additional information that you collect, so like the number of questions, also the sampling strategy and the number of enumerators that you have. Um, if you have, for example, a snowball sampling strategy, um, transport might take a lot of time. If you have to follow up on the next respondent who might be located far away. Um, but also a relatively simple survey can be conducted over the phone and you might not really have to visit everybody but you can just give them a call to confirm if they gave planting material, sold planting material or received planting material and ask some additional questions. So as any research, seed tracing study starts with a proper research design where you decide on the sampling size, strategy, uh, what type of planting material will be traced, the time frame, and so on. Um, it's also very important to pre-test your tool um, to make sure that it works the way you designed it and if you whatever you had in mind is actually really possible. Um, yeah, the data can be collected via surveys, and as I mentioned, it's it's easiest to do it on a uh, to do it digitally. When all data is collected, the data can be processed and preferably using R Studio software. And with this software, you can also visualize the network and start interpreting your data. Each tracing can be combined with a lot of other research methods. Such as a household survey, like every person that you interview, you can collect additional information from them, such as demographic information. Um, it can also be combined with willingness to studies, um, for example, to see how a network might change based on farmers' willingness to pay or their willingness to adopt, assess. And it can also be used in combination with agronomic data such as which of the actors have pests and diseases on their farms or which use some certain management practices and so on. So information on gender or other socioeconomic characteristics of the respondents can be collected and it can be used to answer certain questions like do men and women have equal access to improved varieties? Um, that means that the gender responsiveness level is one. Gender is a significant factor in this tool, but it's not the main reason for using it. So a limitation of seed tracing is that um, snowball sampling is a very suitable method to select participants. But in practice, it can be really challenging to apply snowball sampling because sometimes it can be hard to follow up on the respondents to really identify them and reach out to them. They might be located too far away or contact details might be missing. And then you can also create some bias. For example, when you follow up on people that you can that are close by and you cannot reach to those that are far away. Um, yeah, so you will miss some information in your network. One of the main advantages of seed tracing is that it provides a visualization of the seed system and that makes it easier to identify where intervention can best be made or which are key nodes in the network and so on. And also this information can be used for an uh, impact network analysis. Okay, thank you everybody for listening. Um, I guess I can continue with the questions. Uh, right. So, uh, Fleur, I'm I'm uh, I'm going to queue up the questions for you. Ah, okay. Okay. So your uh, your first question is from Carl Wall, and uh, he asks, with seed tracing, if conducting the survey before farmers source seeds, is there a risk? that they will give idealized cases? Um, you mean if you ask them where they want to go source their material, where they plan on sourcing it? Yes. Will they, will they make up 
an answer instead of telling you where they'll really get it. Yeah, I, I think that is definitely possible. And even not intentionally, like they may, might have something in mind and then there comes another opportunity and they, they change. So yeah, I definitely think that uh, that is a risk if you just ask them, where do you plan to get seat? I would always do it afterwards. Like, where do you, did you actually get your seat? Okay, super. And we have another question from uh, Charles Staber who says, it would seem that step number one is the definition of questions to be answered. Do you have any examples of specific questions which RTB teams have tried to answer? Um, yes, I actually realized during the presentation that I forgot to mention that, but I included the small image and that is from a network where they try to identify um, key nodes in a network. So people that uh, share or spread a lot of seeds. And that was for um, health management. Because if people share a lot of seed, they potentially also can share a lot of pests and diseases. So if they know who those people are and they know there's a disease outbreak, they can better identify where to quarantine or where to take measures. So that's an example of a research question like what are key notes in a network? Okay, super. We have another question from Jan Lowe, who says, please provide a practical example of how you would apply seed tracing. Are you asking for names and locations and quality of seed? Um, yes, we have done that in, uh, in quite some cases. So you, you actually go to the field and you, you um, select your farmers either via just uh, random sampling or snowball sampling and you can even use a gps like where these farms actually are and place them on a map um, you can ask farmers to rate the quality but even if you wanted you could do it with um, actual measurements on the farm like if there was disease presence or anything like that so you can really add a lot of information to a seed tracing study. The only thing you start with is like a note from where the seed came to where the seed went. And yeah, the, whatever you want to know additionally about either the notes or the transactions, you could actually ask that. It depends on the research design. Okay, excellent. Um, we have another question from Mark Tokula who asks, how will the seed tracing overcome the problem of multiple names given to the same varieties in different locations when done with phone? So like the same variety may have different names in different parts of the country. Yeah, um, yeah, that's indeed um, an issue. And um, we recently did a seed tracing study and um, the government provided us with a list of all the local names in the area. So we were um, in 95 of the cases, we could actually rename the variety to an official name, but it's not always possible. If you really want to make it accurate, you could do like a fingerprinting exercise um, with your seed tracing, but yeah, then it becomes a lot more complicated and a lot more expensive, but it also becomes more accurate. So that would be a possibility. And I would always try to really find an institution that can give you uh, local names because usually they have some idea about the local names. We have a question from Anna Wamache who says, how do you handle multiple answers of seed sourcing from, uh, from one respondent, such as from local multipliers, from own farm and from research center? So yeah, like sometimes, uh, a person might get their seed from three different places. So how does seed tracing handle that? Um, yeah, to, to make it easier, it is always good to think on forehand, like what you are exactly going to trace and in, in what time frame. So you could, for example, ask what was the original source of a variety? So where did you get this variety first, a specific variety? Or you could ask, where did you get your seed last season? Um, then it's still possible that they give multiple answers, but you can also visualize that in the network. So then you just get more linkages between them. But it is very good to, to set boundaries. Otherwise, you don't really know what you are tracing. I hope that answers the question. 
Well, I think so. And if, if it doesn't, I, I'm sure they'll get back to us. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, we have a question from Basil Mugunola, who says, farmers in our setting use a lot of saved and recycled seeds, especially for RTB crops. And they may not even recall where the seed came from. How does this tool handle this? Um, yeah, that's very true. So first of all, you can map um, farm safe seeds, then the node just gets a loop to itself. So you can actually yeah, map how many farmers use their own seed or get it from an off-farm source. Um, yeah, if they don't remember things, that's yeah, that's a limitation which is just very hard to um, yeah, to solve. And like I said, it can also really result in bias because um, farmers will always remember the, the links, for example, from a neighbor. They will know a lot of information from the neighbor. But if it was just a random transaction, like they walk by a field, it looked nice, they asked for some seeds, they just won't have the information. And, and that's the reality. But it's always good to remember that so that you can at least mention that there likely is some bias. Yeah. Okay. Super. Right, we've got another question from Carl Wall, who says, we're talking about seed tracing in, in uh, inverted commas, but seeds can travel distances that RTB cannot practically. Do you see physical distance limits emerging with transfer of vegetatively propagated planting materials? So yeah, RTB seed generally doesn't travel very far. So is this distance limitation? Uh... Um, yeah, well, I have not done a lot of research on true seed crops, so I don't know how big their networks are. But I do have to say that I am surprised sometimes, like how far people transport the seeds on the back of a motorbike or in a truck. So seeds still move quite some distances and even across borders and so on. Um, but yeah, like I said, I can't, I don't know about true seed crops. So maybe those networks even have larger distances, could be possible. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question from Dennis Munya Barame, who asks how the seed tracing study can improve the seed system. Okay, so that's the million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, so like in the example I gave earlier, if you um, know the key nodes in a network, um, you could work with these nodes, for example, to prevent diseases because they will probably yeah, spread them very fast. You could also use them as introduction points for new varieties because you know that they have a lot of links and give or sell a lot of seeds. Um, it also helps you maybe understand um, who are the people who do not have access. Is there maybe a difference in access between men and women? So there's actually a lot of these kind of questions that you could answer with the um, seed tracing study. And then based on that information, you can design your intervention. So you can say, okay, we really need to help these people getting access or, oh, we should really start spreading this variety with these key actors. Okay. We have uh, another question from Gentle Comey, who says, how do you account or trace seeds transported by animals, especially invasive species? Yeah, I think that's uh, uh, mainly applicable to uh, true seed crops because the RTB crops are, are, they are quite big. So I don't really know about uh, a lot of animals spreading these, but um, yeah, we don't usually take that into consideration in the seed tracing study. It's really between, yeah, human actors, so to say. Okay, we don't have any more questions. We have a few people who've left answers in the in the chat. Um, so uh, Eric uh, Delaki has said, in our work in Southeast Asia, we have documented cassava seed transfer 
over 500 kilometers. When RTBs become commercialized, the assumptions that RTB seeds are not transportable quickly disappears. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's very true indeed. We we sometimes see that they're transported over really large distances. Um, yeah, it will be different, I guess, if you really go from one continent to another, then through seats, yeah, you can move it by plane. Uh, but still, like, it really crosses boundaries. Uh, with trucks and so on, they redistribute it. And then, historically, cassava somehow got from uh, South America to yeah. Africa. So not, not quite sure how that happened, but somehow they, they managed to do it. Um, here's a question from uh, Mihireto Cherinet, who says, in the informal seed system, the real source may not be known clearly. How does seed tracing help to understand this? I'm sorry, I got distracted there. I was well, reading it myself. Happens. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, he says, uh, uh, in the informal seed system, the real source of the seed may not be well known. So how does seed tra tracing help to understand this? Yeah, well, the thing is we, we try, of course, to find out uh, what the original source is. And yeah, indeed, it, in some cases, it turn, just turns out to not be possible um, to trace that back because they, the farmers might not remember or they might not have contact details or sometimes they do not even want to give the contact details if they eh, are not sure if the others are comfortable if that gets shared. So you you have to try your best but that's the reality that sometimes you, you just cannot find it out but um from experience there are quite some farmers that do remember and then you also get confirmation from the other farmer institute like yes indeed this person came to me for seed and i gave that so it is possible but it, it has its limitations okay and uh thanks very much Fleur. I think we're going to, I think it's time to wrap it up now. Um, so um, thanks everyone for a lively question and answer session. We're going to hear next about INA. This is a method that is tied, is closely tied to seed tracing. And we're going to hear from Karen Garrett now. Karen is a professor at the University of Florida. She's a, uh, a plant pathologist and she is in the Department of uh, Plant Pathology, Food Systems Institute and Emerging Pathogens Institute. So we're very glad to have Karen here and take it away. Hi, this is Karen Garrett, and I'll be talking about Impact Network Analysis, or ENA. So the purpose of Impact Network Analysis is to provide scenario analyses, um, and in our context, thinking about seed system outcomes. So given what we know about a system, what can we logically conclude about the outcomes for it? So here are four examples of key types of questions where we can think about these and different variations on them. So one, one key question is a question about what locations are particularly important for system management. So that might be system management in terms of making sure that improved varieties get out or system management in terms of making sure that pathogens don't spread through the system. So often the same locations are important for, for both those aspects of system management. Then a second type of question, how are the benefits of the system distributed by gender and age? So when we're considering a seed system and, and we characterize it in terms of the networks that are part of it, we can see whether the, the people who are positioned in the network in beneficial ways, um, whether, whether that sort of beneficial position is associated with gender or age or not, or whether it's an equitable system. And we can also, um, look at whether what sorts of changes in the system would be necessary to make the system more equitable. Then a third type of question, how could subsidies and policies influence systems outcomes? So if we can implement different kinds of subsidies to, for example, 
increase the probability that people in the system will choose a particular variety or choose a particular kind of disease management? How will that affect, propagate through the system? And then a fourth type of question, are the observations that we see about the seed system over time in lines with the goal for a project? So uh, to inform monitoring and evaluation and, and how the maybe the shortfalls in the system, uh, how what the implications are, are for those over time. So the impact network and analysis model has this sort of structure in the middle of it, at the heart of it. Uh, so a socioeconomic network. So that's a network of people who are making decisions about uh, adopting varieties or adopting different kinds of management, for example, for protecting seed health. And then this network is linked with a seed and path and potentially pathogen movement network. So the, the people in the top uh, part of this system, uh, in the top network here, are making decisions, influencing each other, and then their decisions play out in the seed and pathogen movement network that's linked to that. So the ENA model combines these in, in the, the model that's then used to see how changes to the system will affect the outcome of it. So the socioeconomic network of decision makers and the seed and potentially pathogen movement network are linked together and together they de define whether or not there'll be success in the system as a whole. So impact network analysis can be used um, across different scales um, from just a, a small number of farms where there, or even within a farm if there's movement of seed within the farm um, up to larger scales. And the people who could be using this technique would be people who design, implement, and evaluate seed systems. And it, it can be used with people with, by people with different levels of experience with programming, though the team would need to include uh, at least one person who does have experience with programming. Or I should say using, using programs. New, new programming probably won't be necessary, but someone that is familiar with how to use programs. So the output then is scenario analysis, answering key questions that have been identified by a research group, like those questions that I mentioned at the beginning. And, um, and this output can be new input as well for pri prioritizing field studies to understand the system better. So it answers what if questions about the different scenarios that uh, people may be interested in, uh, potential management and policy changes to make a system better. And so the audience again, um, as for the users, includes seed intervention designers, implementers, and evaluators. And um, the output from it can also be valuable for other people uh, like donors and policymakers who are thinking about how the system works and what uh, sort of inputs they might have to the system to improve it. So thinking about the minimum sample size, so impact network analysis can be used to consider just hypothetical scenarios just based on these kind of what if questions. What if you have a system like this, then what are the implications? Uh, so there doesn't necessarily have to be any data collection, but then if you want uh, to use impact network analysis to give precise estimates that will be used for uh, precise uh, recommendations, then you need enough data to characterize the system. So if the system is very uh, complicated and heterogeneous, then you'd need more data to be able to characterize it well. So resources and timing. So uh, thinking about if you already got data in hand or you're considering a hypothetical scenario, then we could think about the number of people, uh, at least one person, probably a team is better to provide different perspectives on the system. But so you need this person or people to organize the data available and define what the scenarios of interest are, what the questions are to be asked. and then uh, computers needed with our software are as free. So it's really just a question of having a computer available to, to run the analyses. And uh, at least one team member, team member needs experience evaluating models in R. So, so 
everybody on the team doesn't need to have that kind of experience, but at least one person will on the team. And then impact network analysis can be used at any point in seed system project. Uh, at the beginning of the project, the application might be more speculative when there's less data available. And then as more data become available, the analyses can become more precise and more focused on the particular scenario being evaluated. So impact network analysis could you be used um, in a one-day workshop. So just sort of exploring uh, different aspects of the outcomes from the model for the scenarios that people are interested in. But then if there's uh, if there needs to be parameter estimation based on complicated data sets, that would probably take a researcher a few weeks to organize that data to be able to input it into the model. And if there need to be new variations on the code, that could take an experienced programmer some other weeks. But we've tried to make that code so it's flexible and already designed to answer the types of questions that people might be interested in. So uh, probably the that step of design or designing and implementing new code would not be necessary for most applications. Let's see. So if you think about the steps for using impact network analysis, then so first uh, deciding on the questions to be asked using it. In that first slide, I gave a few examples of questions. Uh, depending on the system, there might be lots of different kinds of structures of questions. Then second, use existing data or define a hypothetical scenario to estimate the model parameters that go into impact network analysis. And as an optional step three, there might be new data collected to describe the seed systems. So step four, use the estimates um, or general scenario characterization in the program in R to evaluate the scenarios. And step five, evaluate the output of the model in light of the questions, which might also uh, stimulate potential follow-up analyses once some of those earlier results are seen. And then six, summarize the results for stakeholders and perhaps prepare a report or journal article. So impact network analysis can be combined with several different methods. So in the, in the general context of getting parameter estimates, those might come from published literature. So literature review could be an important, an important stage of the impact network analysis. There might be new biological studies in the field, so collected to characterize crops, pathogens, or field conditions. And there could be new social studies in the field that might, for example, characterize farmer decision-making about management, and then the structure of seed systems too, for example, um, who is exchanging seed with who? Uh, where do people tend to trade seed or buy seed? And so, for example, other, other tools in the toolbox can also be used to help characterize these systems. So, so then when thinking about gender in the context of impact network analysis, we can ask questions like these. So if gender influences access to management, what are the implications for farmer success over time in the system? Or another type of question, if gender influences a person's position in seed networks, what are the implications? And so that position is well related to the same question of access, right? So uh, if a person's position is influenced by their gender, then does that make them have greater access? Or then if there's a, a chain of exchange, does the person's gender influence uh, who is also going to be receiving seed from them? So, so you can look at the larger structure, not just where an individual gets seed and maybe provides seed, but what sorts of chains of movement through the seed network might occur and how gender influences that. And then a last question here, for example, how would seed systems need to change to be equitable with regard to gender or other human traits like age, et cetera? So given, so, we, so it would be interesting characterizing the system as it is, and then also thinking about what changes would need to be made to uh, make the system more equitable. 
So limitations of impact network analysis. So uh, it can be challenging to collect enough data about the structure of seed systems to give precise recommendations based on impact network analysis. So some analyses would just be limited to discussing general traits of systems and the, uh, the implications of particular assumptions about systems or potential hypothetical systems. So, so that's a main limitation, the, the need to get enough data to characterize the system well if, if the goal is to give precise recommendations. So then the advantages of impact network analysis are, are it's, it's used to improve understanding of how seed systems function and what strategies are likely to be more successful at changing those seed systems so that they'll be more useful for the people in them and more equitable. So as some examples here, um, we've got an introduction to the impact network analysis and illustration of scenarios in it for looking at managing the spread of regional disease or improving the spread of crop varieties. Then uh, here are some examples as well for uh, potato seed systems and sweet potato systems uh, in Ecuador, Uganda, and Georgia. So thanks for your attention. This is Karen Garrett, and here's my email address if you'd like to be in contact uh, for more information. Also some links for user guides and description sheets that uh, describe impact network analysis and how it can be used. Okay. Thanks, Karen. We have a question now from uh, Seten Gebiyehu in Ethiopia who asks, what will be the best team composition? That is the disciplinary background experience and how many people to conduct a seed system study using INA? Oh, yeah, thanks for that question. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so if, if you're constructing a dream team for using impact network analysis, uh, you'd, you'd probably want to represent three types of disciplines. So, so like I mentioned, a person with experience in, in using R and thinking about models in R, and a person who's familiar with the biological aspects of the system. So for example, if you're considering uh, spread of disease in a system, someone who has experience with thinking about how that disease works in the system, and also a person uh, with social science experience who has experience and expertise in thinking about the human interactions in the system. So, um, so those three types of, of people would be good to have on your team. And then, you know, if, if you can represent each of those types of people with more than one person, then that's even better, you know, like if you have other perspectives on the system. There used to be a method called Sondeo, which was widely used and is <clears throat> kind of been forgotten. But that was designed with a maximum of six people because that was how many would fit in a car. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a reasonable approach. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. It's not a joke. It's the truth. So, um, Okay, I've done something I've done something clever here and lost the name of the person who asked it, but I have the I have the question. It is uh, sometimes the choice of variety is made based on the customer preferences. Where is this one captured in the analysis? So where does the analysis capture customer preferences? Oh, okay, yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, so if, if we're thinking about uh, a variety moving through a network of farmers, we, we might want to form more than one network. Um, for example, or, or, or consider more than one network. For example, in the chat, um, back when Fleur was presenting, I entered the link to the study by Anderson et al. And so in that analysis, we had information about movement by multiple varieties. And so we could look at those as essentially different networks. And so, so, that's a, so looking at them as different networks might be important uh, for understanding, for example, why, uh, 
one variety might have a widespread through the potential people and that could be using it, while another variety might have a limited spread. And some of the tools that are coming up, I think on the, the, the next meeting, we'll get into more of those uh, aspects of how people make decisions about which variety they want to use. But once you know something about that structure of the network, which might be small uh, and limited for one variety, but expansive for another variety, then you can look at um, uh, the comparison and do these other analyses about who, who is accessing one variety versus who is accessing the other variety. Of course, if you just know that network structure, you don't necessarily know why that's happening. But then if you use some of the other tools in the toolbox that will get discussed tomorrow, I believe, um, then you can have a better understanding of why people made those decisions. But then once you know the network for one variety and the network for another variety, um, if they're both uh, susceptible to a pathogen that you're interested in, then you could see, you know, you could combine them to see uh, their combined effect on disease risk. But you might want to keep them separate if they have different uh, traits for farmers too. Like in that Anderson et al. example with the link up above in the chat, uh, some varieties in this study were orange flesh sweet potatoes, while others were not. So, so then the orange flesh sweet potatoes would also have an important role in nutrition. So, so their spread through the system would have wider implications as well. Okay, super. Well, we have another question now from Anna Wamache, who says, is it correct to assume that INA looks at longitudinal data? And if so, how far back is the period of assessment? So like historical, how far back can it look? Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for that question. You could, you could uh, define the question that you're applying impact network analysis to answer in terms of a more recent period or a longer period. Uh, if you combine information from across a long period into the same network analysis, that could get harder to interpret if some of the links represent what might have happened a decade ago and some of the links represent what's happening now. So that would be part of the design question for doing the analysis would be to figure out which interval you want to emphasize. Uh, but, but you could use it across uh, for, for historical periods or current periods, depending on the question you're interested in and the data that you have available. Oh, and I see that um, uh, a suggestion from Jorge that I talk about how seed tracing and ENA can work together and the difference between them. So, so seed tracing, as Fleur was discussing, is a way to collect information to characterize what the uh, seed movement network is like. And so once you, once you understand what the seed network is like, you can answer some questions immediately, right? Like uh, uh, if you're interested in the gender effects on the system, you can answer immediately from considering that network, how often do, does one gender supply seed to the other gender, for example? And then if you want to go another step and do scenario analyses with impact network analysis, you can use that network estimated through seed tracing as input into impact network analysis, and then see in scenario analyses uh, what the implications are of that network structure. For example, if a new variety comes into the system, how does it tend to move through that network? Or, or if a disease enters the system, how does the pathogen tend to move through the network? And what, can you, what would be the hypothetical changes you could make um, in the network that would slow the disease or speed the movement of the improved variety. Okay, um, we've got a couple minutes left and a couple questions. Samuel Kalimunjaye asks, can we use INA to measure the effectiveness of certain seed system interventions? Yeah, so, so that's one of the aspects of impact network analysis I think is most interesting is if, if you, uh, evaluate what a current network looks like by using seed tracing, for example, uh, then you have that network in mind and you can see what the implications are of that network in terms of if a, if a new variety enters in like one region, where is it likely to spread and who is it likely to spread to, who will have access to that new variety. 
But then you could take that network and say, uh, suppose uh, through some kind of educational programs or some kind of subsidies, we could change who has access and we could change that network in particular ways. For example, maybe make sure people in one region or, uh, or maybe if you want to focus on women, like if you can increase the number of links that whoever your target audience is, if you can increase the number of links and the types of links they have in the system, then what are the logical implications if you try to introduce a new variety? Okay, and then uh, if we have a quick time for a quick answer for one more question um, from uh, Mihiretu. Can we use INA to measure the effectiveness of certain seed system interventions? I just asked you that, didn't I? I'm getting my questions mixed up. Um, this this one's from Sa this one. This is the one from Samuel. Uh, he says, "Thanks for the presentation. I would like to know what is and how possible is validation of INA and at what stage." Oh yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, just as it can be hard to get enough data to really characterize the system well, and then look at the uh, logical implications. It can also be challenging to get enough data to then validate that. So in, in some cases, we might have to just stick with the idea that we have some data about a system and we can do speculative analyses. But then once you have more data about a system, especially if you have time series of data, then you could start to validate the impact network analysis in terms of seeing uh, what does happen uh, at, over time and whether what happens over time is what you expected. Uh, if you wanted to do a really fine validation of impact network analysis, you might want to have multiple seed systems, maybe like a randomized control trial. So, so an extensive validation like that would be a big undertaking. But you could think about different degrees of validation uh, if you have a smaller data set or if you're setting up a large uh, randomized control trial with multiple villages with different predictions and interventions. OK, super. Well, Karen, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move along now. We're going to hear from Lava Kumar. Lava is the head of germplasm health and virology at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in Ibadan, Nigeria. He's also the inventor of the seed tracker. So it's a pleasure to have you with us today, Lava. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Lava Kumar, based at IIT headquarters in Ibadan, Nigeria. I will provide a brief introduction to Z-Tracker, one of the tools of the RTB toolbox. Before introducing the tool, I would like to mention some of the key challenges that have inspired the development of Z-Tracker. RTB seed production in Sub-Saharan Africa is dominated by the informal seed producers. The seed value chain is disjointed with the limited connection between various seed value chain actors. It is not easy to know where the seed producers are, where the seed being produced, and the quantities of seed produced on an annual basis. Seed producers and buyers often face challenges in finding each other. Similarly, regulators cannot trace seed production or the quality of the seed entering into the market. There is a need for a simple tool for seed value chain mapping, integration of seed value chain actors, and help formalize the informal seed sector. With these objectives in mind, Seed Tracker tool was developed. Seed Tracker is a multi modular digital tool for fostering seed system development. The features of the tool help mapping and integration of seed value chain actors. Users can self register following simple procedures. The Seed Tracker features guide production of seed in compliance with the regulatory requirements and quality seed production protocol. It simplifies the accreditation of seed producers and easy certification by the regulatory authorities. Since all the data concerning with seed is available in a single database, it provides ready information on seed production by class of seed, variety, geographic location, year of production, quantity of seed produced, and other essential information necessary for trend analysis and forecasting. Seed Tracker offers variety of functionalities necessary for all value chain actors. 
The tool is easy to use, flexible, and adaptable to other crops and countries. It can be made available in multiple languages. For instance, seed tracker versions in English, French, Portuguese, and Swahili are already in use. It offers a variety of features necessary for seed users, including GPS capture, geographic maps, and map-based navigation. It is usable on any internet-enabled device and Android phone. Seed tracker offers digital data collection forms necessary for inputting data, which also operates in areas without internet. The offline features is an important requirement to enable this tool usage in areas where there is no internet connectivity. The data get captured into the device when the device get connected to the Wi-Fi network. The data is automatically transmitted to the seed tracker database. The data in the seed tracker can be downloaded in different file formats. It also offers analytical features for ready visualization of maps and graphics. The tool also offers complementary functionality to link with uh, other relevant tools, for example, Nuru, which offers disease diagnostics or ACLEMO, which offers agronomy advisory services. Where in the seed value chain, seed tracker can be used? As illustrated in this diagram, seed tracker functionalities cover all the way from early generation seed production to decentralized seed multiplication. This is where bulk of the commercial seed is produced and to the marketing stage. I will provide the case of seed tracker used for strengthening cassava seed systems in Nigeria to highlight some of its key features. Cassava is an important food security crop propagated using stem cuttings. The formal seed system exists to produce breeder, foundation, and certified seed. Regulations are also in place for seed certification overseen by the National Agriculture Seed Council of Nigeria. However, the contribution of the formal seed system to the overall seed market is meager compared to the semi-formal or informal producers who dominate the production and marketing. The challenge with this situation is that the bulk of the seed production and supply is obscure. The basics project commissioned with phase one in 2016 and phase two since 2020 is working to strengthen and formalize cassava seed systems to enhance the production and supply of quality seed of improved cassava varieties and create enabling conditions for sustainable and profitable cassava seed enterprises. To help attain this mission, Seed Tracker was adopted as a cassava seed tracker or CST to digitalize the seed value chain in Nigeria. It features all essential functionalities necessary for seed producers, regulators, traders, researchers, and extension services. It has a web interface that offers essential information with regard to the released varieties, entry point for accessing seed accounts. It also has map-based navigation system to access seed fields and also to track the seed value chain actors. The Kasawa Seed Tracker has digitalized all essential operations of seed production as per the regulatory requirements and it also includes provisions for seed certification uh, that includes pre-planting certification, post-planting, and final inspection certification and provision of labeling at the time of harvest. The system also offers a digital catalog of improved cassava varieties that were released in Nigeria as of 2020. After pilot testing in 2016, the cassava seed tracker was adopted for regular use in Nigeria for registering cassava seed production data. About 120 to 200 seed producers are registered annually in seed tracker. They are all depicted on the map that is shown here. The bar graphs indicates the growth of seed field data in seed tracker since 2016. This information is um, presented by class of seed, that is breeder, foundation, and commercial seed, by geographic zone. As you can see, the commercial seed production is dominated in the north central zone that is here, whereas the elder generation seed production, that is breeder and foundation seed, is mainly in southwest zone. This slide demonstrates the landscape of cassava seed production in Nigeria since 2016. It is also possible to sort this 
seed production data by class of seed and year of production. For example, the map here shows production of breeder seed, whereas this map shows the distribution of foundation seed production in Nigeria. It is not only that, it is also possible to query site-specific information. For example, from the same From the same map based information, it is possible to review the variety information. For example, by clicking the HTML link here, it opens a separate page demonstrating the information concerning with potential yield, dry matter content, geographic suitability for different uh, zones, uh, and then also the images of the tuber shape and the, the tuber color. It is possible also to make connection with the seed producer by submitting this expression of interest form. This form automatically extracts the data from this seed field. It, pre, it, is, it prefills variety data, etc. All users have to do is uh, to provide the quantities that they are expecting to procure and by which date and submit. So the, the producer will receive as a, an alert by email as well as SMS. It is also possible to make connection with the producer through WhatsApp. The basic idea of having this, uh, these features is to enable market access. The seed producer can make connection with the buyer and likewise the buyer can readily review the information from the map and make contact with the seed producer. So this feature actually helps the marketing of the seed being produced uh, in Nigeria. It is also possible from the seed record data to verify the growth of different varieties over a period of time. For example, this graphic shows the number of varieties planted since 2016 and, and by far TMEB 409 is the dominant variety planted each year. For instance, in 2020, of about 10 varieties planted, TMEB 409 occupies uh, 114 fields of nearly 170 fields planted, so which indicates the popularity of this variety. And from the same data, it is also possible to monitor year-on-year -year changes of these varieties, also possible to look at the dynamics of seed production by geographic location and class of seed. So there are many possibilities since all the seed data is held in single database and there is an automatic analytics feature that facilitates this kind of graphic creation. Another recent addition is the, the development of Android version of the seed tracker. So now this is the Android version of seed tracker is downloadable from Google Play and using this um, app it is possible to register seed fields at this moment it is only enabled for Nigeria and it is also possible to verify the seed seed production based on the map based navigation and make connection with the seed producers we also provided a seed outlet feature for dedicated uh, sales of early generation seed coming from the go seed and other private enterprises here it is possible directly to make connection with the seed producer and submit order form so once again, all of this is, all these functionalities is to help promote uh, variety as well as enhance the marketing of the, the quality seed being produced by the accredited seed producers. Here is another functionality of seed tracker that is adopted for e-certification purposes, purposes by the National Agricultural Seed Council. It offers a simple five-step procedure for registering of seed companies and seed producers with NASC through this online platform. It, of, it offers a quick review by the NASC regulatory authorities and for the qualified producers issue electronic certificate of accreditation. So this is just to showcase the modular functionality, how the single system can be used both for tracking seed production and the same system can be used for e-certification as well as for registering seed producers. So with regard to the timing and duration of using seed tracker in a project cycle, as explained, seed tracker functionalities cover all aspects of the seed value chain. It, it is a, a good tool for using for monitoring the project implementation. Since all the data is held in a single place by all value chain actors, it is also a good tool for using as a monitoring and evaluation tool for learning purposes, as well as for problem identification troubleshooting, diagnostics, scoping, and trend analysis. 
With regard to the level and usage, I already provided an example of cassava seed tracker used in Nigeria. On a similar lines, cassava seed tracker has been piloted since 2018 in Tanzania as part of the best project by MIDA, Toski, and IITA. Uh, in last year, Embrapa adopted cassava seed tracker for seed value chain management of Rainiva project. Early this year, seed tracker was piloted in Ghana for yam value chain management. Basically, what it demonstrates is that the seed tracker is usable for multiple crops. It can be used in multiple countries. It can be tailored to the needs of the user. So it's a very flexible tool that can be adopted for any part of the seed value chain management. With regard to the output and audience, the main output from the seed tracker is the big data concerned with seed production and seed value chain actors. With regard to audience, the tool is suitable for seed producers, seed regulators, traders, buyers, researchers and extensions, as well as NGOs, especially for tracking variety dissemination, promoting the varieties, monitoring the variety replacement, and also for monitoring evaluation learning and other uses. So what it takes to adopt seed tracker? It all starts with defining the use. Once that is done, a consultation meeting will be held with the user to tailor seed tracker features to fit to the user purpose. Then the updated module will be piloted, followed by training to users on how to use seed tracker as well as managing seed tracker operations independently. Adopting this tool basically requires access to internet enabled devices and the internet connection. Usually this process could take anywhere between one week to several weeks. It all depends on the complexity of the use and where it is being used. And the budget requirements also depends on the use. Uh, usually there are some features which doesn't cost anything, but other anything that requires tailoring to the user space, user defined needs may take anywhere between $1,000 upwards. Why this funding? This is mainly, mainly used for reprogramming and also to establish sometimes infrastructure necessary for adopting seed tracker at the user end. So what are the limitations? Seed tracker is an ICT tool and obviously it is dependent on access to internet enabled device and internet data. Without these two, it is not, it is difficult to use seed tracker features. So what are the main advantages of the tool? Seed tracker is an all-in-one ICT application customizable to suit user needs. It is flexible, convenient, and easy to adopt for different crops, organizations, and contexts. It offers real-time monitoring, seed database, it enables data-driven decisions, and offers information for other tools. And finally, it is a cost-effective tool for formalizing informal seed systems and also to support decentralized quality assurance programs, which is on rise. I conclude by acknowledging our partners, NASC, NRCR, and CRS, and the donors of the Seed Tracker Program Development, RTB, Google, Basics, and ISWA. You can access more information through the web links that are provided here. And for any further information, you can contact me by email. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Lava. Well, we've got several questions. Let's start with one from Lawrence Kent, who says, can Lava tell us more about the use of Seed Tracker to simplify certification of stems and to facilitate marketing of stems produced by commercial seed entrepreneurs in Nigeria? Thank you. Thank you, Ken uh, Lawrence, for this good question. Um, <clears throat> you, in your question, you, you highlighted the two very important objectives which stimulated the development of seed tracker. How does it help simplify certification? The, the digital system, the coding system that is incorporated in the seed tracker and the digital data collection forms have been tailored to automatically comply with the national regulatory requirements that would enable certification of qualified uh, seed. So that way it simplifies. Another aspect is that it also takes away the need for visiting offices for submitting paper-based application forms, which has been highlighted as one of the 
the bottlenecks for compliance. So the digital tool simplifies both submission as well as tailoring the production practices to the regulatory requirements. And with regard to the marketing aspect, as I showed um, in the presentation, one of the things, one of the benefits of using C-Tracker is the visibility. Uh, once an app is downloaded, all app users can benefit from receiving alerts. If anybody submits a request for a seed, they all get an alert. Likewise, it also gives a, a, an opportunity for a seed buyer to specifically choose a particular a seller nearest to them or a seller who is actually producing and marketing a variety of choice to make a specific contact. So all this is made possible uh, by the seed tracker. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's a question from Daniel Mandoa, who says, we are really struggling to establish a workable cassava seed system in Malawi. Can I include other players in the seed tracker and adopt it to Malawi? It would be great now that we have the SAH, which seems to be a promising technology for some of our challenges in the seed value chain. Oh yeah. Um, in fact, we it is quite easy to adopt uh, seed tracker to Malawi. All it requires is, uh, as I mentioned, you need to define the use, like at what level you want to use. You want to use it at project level or you want to use it as a national level. If you want to use it as a national level, then it is better to engage with the regulator so that we can start working with them uh, to set up a system which is in compliance with national regulatory requirements for cassava seed production as well as marketing. But if you want to use it as a, a specific project tool, that is also possible. So it is quite flexible and uh, I'd be very happy to work with you. We also have, IAT also has an office uh, with the Kasao program there. Uh, through them, you can contact us. So we'll get back to you and um, set up the system for your requirements. Okay. Here's a question from Desdadi Peter Mlay in, Tanz in Tanzania, who says, in Tanzania, we have Toski as the Seed Certification Institute carrying out the same tasks as uh, NASC in Nigeria. So I guess that's a comment really more than a question. Uh, Love, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that. Yeah, uh, Toski is already piloting uh, Seed Tracker for cassava in Tanzania. So, and they're also working, they're also, Toski and NASC also interacting very closely to learn from each other experience. So it's actually a good painting. Yeah. Okay. Here's a question uh, from uh, Jean Ndirigwe, who says, Dear Lava, how do you ensure or verify the quality of declared seed at the producer level? How do inspectors verify the quality of seed before certification? Yeah. Uh, it is done two ways. Number one, there are, there are guidelines who can use seed tracker. Seed tracker is a tool for the seed producer who have been accredited. So that means they are already under the uh, they are already under the scrutiny of the regulatory agencies. And the only way they can stay on the system is by ensuring compliance to the monitoring guidelines. And the inspection is carried by the, the regulatory authorities. And there is a separate module which facilitates inspection aspect simultaneously. There is no need for any extra application submitted because once the seed field is registered, automatically it sends an alert to the regulatory agencies they will deploy a, an inspector closest to their field to perform inspections. So that will be done normally. And the data, the regulatory inspectors also feed the data into the seed tracker system so that all the data is in one place. Once a, the field is accredited, it appears as a field that has passed certification. In case of the seed is failed certification, that will not appear uh, for a sale process. So that the stems can be, um, stems are 
forbidden from further reuse as a seed, but the roots can be harvested for consumption and sale in the markets. Okay, super. Here's a, a question from Seten Gebeyehu in Ethiopia who asks, what major technical adjustments or modifications are needed to adapt the tool for other crops, such as potato and sweet potato? The major modification is going to be under the production planning form and the crop management because these are very specific aspects and change for each crop. For example, some crops are plantable multiple years. Uh, some like cassava usually planted once per year. So we have to make certain adjustments to enable the crop cycles and likewise the propagation type and all of it. So usually these changes from our experience so far, it's just a matter of a couple of days of uh, programming. So we have the frameworks which have been already uh, developed for all RTBs, um, cassava, yam, uh, sweet potato, as well as potato. So these modifications can be done relatively straightforward. And more recently, we are also uh, adopting this tool for uh, cereal crops like maize and rice in Nigeria. So what we learned is uh, these modifications are relatively straightforward and doesn't take much time. Okay, and we have a brief clarifying comment from uh, Daniel. Mandua, who says, I am actually working for IITA in Malawi. Oh, great. <laughs> so it's much easier than to make connection. And uh, Ana Wamache has um, uh, three questions. Um, I'll, I'll just read you all three at once. Uh, is there an integration phase with existing in-country ICT systems? And she asks, what are the lessons learned in applying the tracker in the informal seed system in Tanzania and transition to a formal system? And lastly, does the seed tracker integrate in harmonization of seed movement across borders? Oh, these are very challenging questions. Um, the first one is really, really easy integration phase with existing in-country ICT systems. It depends on whose ICT systems uh, is being referred here. Is it an organization propagating, uh, promoting the seed or is it regulatory agencies? Um, we have experience in with both, usually it changes by country. For example, uh, I can give uh, site our experience with working with the uh, Nigerian regulatory agency, they already have an ICT system. During piloting uh, phase, we hosted it on IATA server. Once the system has passed all the checks and balances, then it has been transferred to the NASC uh, ICT systems. So this generally requires consultation with uh, their administration unit on how this transfer is going to take place. So this is all again, a case by case issue. This is not something we can generalize. Uh, but what is most important is this integration is straightforward. We have examples of uh, establishing a standalone system as a new, as well as integrating seed system, seed tracker with the already established I ICT systems. So this transition should be straightforward. Um, with regard to the second question, what are the lessons learned in applying seed tracker in the informal seed systems in Tanzania? So far, it was done only for cassava. Uh, it is it is being piloted as part of a project. So the first aspect is familiarization. People have not used to digital tools for the seed management. So obviously, the tool need to be introduced to the all the value chain actors who are going to use this tool, and also need to explain to them what are the benefits and what it takes to adopt. Um, and then it requires little hand holding, especially. Uh, to teach them how to use and how to use the tool and how do they benefit from the data that uh, is incorporated into this tool, uh, all of it. Um, so far, we in the informal sector also, we have different levels. We can't generalize all seed producers at the same, uh, the same category with regards to their IT literacy. So there are some uh, stakeholders who are well aware of using ICT tools for them uh, the learning curve is uh, short, whereas 
at the grassroots level, those who have not exposed, especially using smartphones, because this is a smartphone based tool, it requires a little more hand holding and sometimes even supplementing uh, the, the smartphones and also providing provisioning uh, data. So we, we have, we are still learning, but uh, this transition generally requires quite a bit of effort. And uh, this is this is most important in order to make this tool successfully adopted by all stakeholders, especially seed producers at the grassroots level. Um, does the seed tracker integrate I'm, I'm harmonization? Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Definitely sorry, but we're, um, uh, we're, uh, we're out of time and... Um, uh, okay, I will type the answers. To move on. Yeah. So I will respond answers online. That's uh, very kind of you. So thank yeah. you so much. And, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on now to experimental auctions. We're going to hear from Eric Delaki. He is a senior research associate with uh, the Alliance of Bioversity and SIAT. He's based in Laos and. Uh, He's written a really fabulous paper on cassava seed flows in uh, Southeast Asia called Raising the Stakes. So if you haven't read that yet, you should. Okay, let's hear from Eric. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric. So glad to have you with us in this session. And I'm gonna be talking to you today about the use of experimental auctions for seed. So starting off, what's the purpose of using experimental auctions? Well, primarily what we want to do with auctions is understand the demand for seed and the willingness to pay for seed and different characteristics of seed. So the, the kind of questions we can ask include things like, how much would a target person or group pay to obtain seed or to accept to use seed of different characteristics? And what traits and conditions affect this price? So an example of traits is like we have on the right here, two varieties of cassava which have different susceptibility to mosaic disease. So we could ask, what is the difference in willingness to pay between these two varieties? This method is intended for uh, use at a group level. So we're talking about understanding the, the behaviors of groups of farmers. Now that could be at several different scales. We could be focusing on a village, a district, a province, or even a nation, uh, depending on what we want to do. For users, we're really talking about seed intervention designers, implementers, practitioners in the seed area, and also business actors who are interested in understanding a bit more about their potential markets. And this map below is showing an example of a seed auction that was conducted by myself and colleagues in Laos in the, over the past year. So you can see on this map, we, we've gone kind of nationwide and we've selected 20 villages in five provinces. So that's just to give you an example uh, of scale. And I'll be talking more about that example throughout this presentation. So what kind of outputs do we get from experimental auctions? Well, importantly, we get price points for seed of those varying characteristics and qualities that we select, estimates of market penetration at different price points, and a willingness to pay models that are based on socioeconomic characteristics. So they relate socioeconomic characteristics to people's willingness to pay in the auction. So an example, of, an example of one of these outputs is on the right here. What we have here is a graph with all 20 villages that I mentioned a minute ago, grouped together by province. And on the x-axis here, we're showing the price that people bid um, for clean seed. So these distributions are showing us the proportion of people that bid at different prices. And this red line is showing us the grand mean bid across all sites. So we can see quickly by looking at different groups that in, in different provinces, there are quite different values. And sometimes they're below the mean bid and sometimes they're above the mean bid. So this gives us an idea of differences in price across all these different areas. So the type of audience for this information includes anybody with an interest in valuing seed characteristics, pricing and adoption strategies for increasing varietal turnover or uptake of varieties. So in order to understand um, the rest of this presentation and how to use auctions, first we have to ask, what is an auction? So some of you may be familiar with this concept and others maybe not. The basic idea is that we want to get people to state the maximum amount that they would be willing to pay uh, in order to get our product or maybe more than one product. 
Um, and the way the way we try to do that is by getting people to compete against one another in a way that encourages them to explain the real value they would actually be willing to pay. So not to give a low value or a crazily high value. So an example of an auction is um, the English auction. So this is the type of auction you may have seen on TV or in a movie where you have a gentleman or a woman who's running the auction and who's calling, in, introducing the products and calling out bids. And they start at a very low amount of money and they keep going up as long as people keep bidding higher and higher. And whoever bids the highest at the end wins. So they, that person has the ability to then pay the price that they bid for. In a Dutch auction, uh, you have the same approach with someone at the front showing the products. And this time they start with a very high value and they gradually reduce that value until they find the person with the highest bid. And that person again wins the auction and has the ability to bid. So in these types of auctions, you have everyone together in a room. They're quite fast and everybody is together bidding. Everyone can see what everyone else is bidding and it creates this feeling of competition. In a sealed bid, people write down the amount they would be willing to pay on a slip of paper and it's kept private. So you can't see what other people have bid. You know you're competing against them, but you can't see any of the other prices. So th this takes a little bit longer to do, um, but it, it has other advantages, which I'll discuss a little bit later. A BDM auction is done one on one. So you have one auctioneer interviewing one farmer at a time and they're showing them the seeds and making them bid and they explain that people are bidding against each other but those people never meet each other it's done completely in private so that one takes quite a bit longer uh, longer to set up but the big advantage is that you can do it one-on-one -on -one. so we're going to focus in, for the rest of this presentation on the most commonly used um, example and what i used in the lao example which is a sealed bid silent auction so people are not discussing with each other and the bid is kept written down and kept private. So what kind of sample size do we need um, to do these experiments? Well, this really depends on your needs. If you're just interested in entering an area where you have no idea about the price and you, you just want to get a quick appreciation for differences, maybe you only need to do an auction with a few tens or dozens of participants. Maybe that is enough to help guide the rest of your, your planning. But if you want to do something a bit more statistically sound, you want to construct a willingness to pay model, and you have several products that you want to separate characteristics, you really need a bit more of, a, of an in-depth um, type of project. So this, in that case, you have to use a sample size calculation. Um, there's an example here below that can help you to calculate based on the power of the statistical analysis that you'll be using, what sort of sample size you should have. And often this will run into the dozens or hundreds of responses. To conduct experimental auctions, um, first we've, we've discussed a little bit before, but a BDM auction can be conducted by a single auctioneer, talking to individual farmers, but for most of the group auctions, we need at least three trained staff, probably more depending on the size of each group. In terms of equipment, sample products, so the seeds you're going to bid on, so you can show them to people, paper slips, flip charts, data recording sheets, and survey forms. In terms of expertise, um, there is some care that needs to be taken during the design phase. So you need to think about statistical power. You need to think about ordering your, your treatments and what kind of treatment levels. So that takes a bit of thought. Auction staff need to be well-trained and they need to be sensitive to the method itself. So they need to understand what, what the experiment is actually trying to do. And data analysis may require experience with economics and econometrics, especially if you want to go more into the willingness to pay models development sort of side of things. So it's very important to conduct the auctions during the season of peak seed demand. So we're talking about, of course, before planting occurs. Think about carefully about the cropping calendars and the needs of your farmers. So for example, during harvest, they're usually only available in early morning for short periods of time. To do a silent auction takes often about three to four hours if you're accompanying it with a survey. So if you're gathering more information about the participants um, in addition to the bids, it also takes plenty of time to meet with local officials to make sure you're, you're following your protocol in selection and gathering the participation, the samples. So that's, that's quite time consuming. Auction group sizes can be modified 
in order to uh, in in order to facilitate the auction process, but they have to be consistent. So if you start with ten people in each auction, you need to stay with ten people in each in each auction. The method is quite sensitive to that. Um, if you have more assistance available, you can work with larger group sizes, which means you can hit your sample size in fewer auctions. And if you have less assistance, maybe you need a larger number of auctions uh, in order to hit that sample size. So to give a, a general example, using again our, our Lao example, so we conducted this 20 village, five province um, auction experiment with four staff in approximately 12 weeks, including travel up and down the country and some planning days and so on. So here's some example steps for conducting your experimental auction. You, you start with selecting the products to be auctioned. So which seeds do you want to sell, compare? Then decide on your elicitation mechanism. So by that, we mean what auction type and also what arrangement. And for example, any other characteristic characteristics of your um, audience that you, that you want to understand. So for example, if you want to make sure to cover different ethnic groups or different regions, that needs to be planned there. Then develop your materials, auction scripts, and bidding sheets. From here, we can develop a sampling design and check the sample size, make sure for that make sure it's relevant for you, your purposes. Then make a data entry and analysis plan. So it's it's important to think a little bit about your analysis before collecting the data. It really helps you to understand what data you need to collect and what you need to focus on. When doing that, consider gender and social differentiation as they may be important to your case. So you understand your own context better than anyone else. So make sure that, you, that you're collecting information um, that, that's related to the important aspects of your participants that, that you want to study. Then train staff carefully, including in trial auctions in the field. So this is really important. We need to do some practice, practice auctions because Many problems are very difficult to spot until you're actually in the field trying it yourself. So you want to make sure you get that out of your system and before you, you really start your auctions. In executing your auctions, stick to your plan as closely as you can. Um, of course, things can happen in the field, but try to stick to that plan uh, that, that, that you know and have developed and trust. After collecting your data, clean it and conduct your analysis with whatever software you choose. So there's no specific software for analyzing this type of data. A, a lot of people use Stata for things like willingness to pay. It's quite popular with economists. You can even just use Microsoft Excel if your plan is just to compare averages and that, that kind of level of analysis. So what methods can we combine with auctions? Well, we've already talked a bit about household surveys. So especially if we want to build a willingness to pay model, so we want to understand what characteristics of the participants change their bids, you have to collect other variables. And household surveys is, is a typical way to do that. So you, what those variables will be really depend on you. Um, there are many, many possibilities. And of course, a lot of socioeconomic indicators are kind of uh, favored for this type of, of analysis. Another example is from the RTB toolbox. So means and chains. Um, auctions can provide you the what. Um, what I mean is that you can under, they can help you to understand how much value people place on these different traits and you get different price points, but means and chains can help you to understand why. So what, what was it about those characteristics that actually gave them that perceived value? So this, this is a really nice complement to auction data. And finally, focus group discussions and village histories. So understanding more about the history and the setting and other things going on in your communities that might have changed the price setting and people's buying behavior. So this is really a really nice um, kind of qualitative exercise. And it's something that can be done usually quite easily if you're already gathering together groups of people in order to do auctions. Thinking about gender at the very simplest level, um, we can separate male and female bids and compare them, like this example on the bottom right. In this case, there was no difference between males and female bids for all three products that we tried. But there are also more complex approaches. Um, we can separate genders and run auctions for men and women separately, or we can interview both members of the same household and try to unpack what the differences are in preferences and behaviors between both sides of the household. 
So there are different options. Limitations of auctions include that you really do need a good understanding of some of the theory behind it. Um, if you don't have this in the field, it's very hard to respond to participants' questions without accidentally biasing the results. So it's quite important for everyone to understand what, what the auction is actually trying to achieve. Um, staff really need to engage in what we, what we often call cheap talk. So it basically means keeping the excitement level down, not exciting people too much and causing them to bid higher than normal. And we should try to focus on using the same script every time. It's really hard to do in the field with many different types of participants, but it's quite important to try. The main advantages include getting price information that's more realistic than simple survey methods. Um, so because we're putting people in competition and there's a real possibility to buy, it, we get much more realistic results. And the method is flexible. We can deploy it in existing markets and we can also use it to scope for potential markets. So it, it's quite flexible in its deployment. Some typical examples of information produced with the auction are on the right. So we can see here um, a graph of price versus percentage of respondents for three different products, red, green, and blue. So if we take an, if we take an arbitrary price point like 10,000 kip, you can see that a different, very different percentage of bids fall above or below that amount. So this can help us to visualize the trade-offs, how, how much of our sample would have bought the product at these different price points. And here's an example of testing the significance between bids for the three products, and we can see highly significant differences between the price bid for each of the three. Here are some examples for farmers' willingness to pay in potato seed in Tanzania and banana planting materials in Uganda that you can check out. And if you want more information on this topic, I, of course, am available, but I would highly encourage you to check out our published user guide and description sheet for experimental auctions both of which are available on the RTB Toolbox website. So thank you very much and uh, good luck in planning your auction. Okay. Hi everybody. All right, thanks very much, Eric. Um, I, I, had, I had a comment actually. Um, I, was, uh, I was very interested in the remark that you made about a cheap talk and uh, I thought that was a thoughtful thing to say. I can imagine that it's uh, quite easy to come in from an institution and you look like important people and you start to, uh, if you, you, it would be pretty easy to hype up the, uh, the price of seed, which would then be, you know, counter to your research objectives. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that, how to, how to manage people's expectations so they don't get too excited. Yeah, that's a great question, Jeff. That's some, the kind of question I would expect from you as an anthropologist. <laughs> um, so cheap, cheap talk is something that, it's not a term I came up with. You find it quite a bit in the literature around auctions and not only auctions for seed, but auctions for all sorts of products. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, the auction protocol. You, you're trying to stimulate some interest and thinking and discussion, but yeah, it's very easy to get carried away. And you, you can get kind of like the classic English auction where the auctioneer is actually trying to get the highest price possible. So that's, that's the purpose of the English auction. Uh, it's maximizing the price. So in our case, uh, we, have, we have a script we followed in Lao that was like quite an even tempered script, not getting things too exciting. Um, and we, we frequently say things throughout the course of the auction, just to remind people of the real qualities of what we're talking about. So to keep, keep realistic expectations um, on, on the point about um, making a big production when you come into the village and getting people excited that way, that's also a, a very important thing to think about. I know in, in my own case, obviously I'm a foreigner and I look quite different. So we really tried to keep minimal, um, minimal exposure. So we, we tried to make sure that we were not coming into town with a big fancy vehicle. Um, we were always holding the auctions at kind of humble local settings. And personally, I tried to stay out of the auction process as much as possible. So I was kind of there on the side to assist, but 
after having trained the staff, I was happy just to sort of let them go for it. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Well, um, we we've got a quite we've got some questions here. Let's uh, let's move to the uh, to the first one. And uh, so Lawrence Kent asks, are there examples of such auction results being used operationally by seed producers, sellers, or is this only an academic methodology? Yeah, I think that's, that's quite a good question from Lawrence. Um, so there are actually many examples in all sorts of different products. In seed, um, I have to say that the use of auctions in seed, especially in uh, vegetatively propagated crops is a lot newer. Um, you can actually find quite a bit more on um, auctions of seed when it's um, cases where it's true seeded grain crops and especially hybrid crops. Um, so so that's, some, that's, uh, that's kind of a more common case. Now, that being said, uh, there are a few examples in the, in the website that I posted the link to in the chat. So the section of the toolbox website dedicated to uh, experimental auctions. Um, there are some examples of auctions being used for, for vegetatively propagated crops in the field. Now I can say in our own case in Laos, um, we're actually currently constructing uh, a model that's working together with private sector actors, in this case, starch factories, uh, cassava starch factories. So they're processing cassava roots and they want to enter into the clean system seed space, but there's actually zero information on price of cassava seed at any point. So I can say actually in the Lao case, this data will be used as a reference price point to evaluate whether the production of clean seed can meet what people are willing to pay. So that's, in our case, we're actively using it in, in that way with private sector partners. Okay. Um, here's a question from Carl Wall. What are options for following up to validate the proposed bids before planting with what was actually paid after planting? Great question from Carl. Yeah, I really appreciate that one. And that's that's something that uh, that we thought about quite a bit quite a bit in our case as well. I I would say in general, there's a number of there's a number of different practices. Um, so one of the one of the ones that's kind of gaining ground at the moment are the the use of sort of experimental shops or experimental like pop up seed sale booths to validate those um, those price points. Uh, in our case, we actually immediate about a month after the after the auctions, we did return to two of the villages that we had uh, conducted the auctions in, with a very large semi trailer with uh, hundreds of bundles of cassava, and we actually did a sale exercise to see how it matched up with uh, our, the results from the auction. So that's one way. Uh, that's one way of, of a kind of pragmatic way you can validate the results. Okay. Here's a, here's a question from Peter Malay in uh, Tanzania. In Tanzania, there is a preset price for the certified materials, especially in cassava. How can experimental auction be used in this case? Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I really appreciate that one. So there's a few ways that an experimental auction could be used in that case. One, one sort of simple one would be just to compare uh, the price people would pay for certified material and uncertified material. So in this case, you'd sort of be asking, uh, yeah, does the, does the price point for uncertified material of different characteristics approach the price of certified material or not? Um, but I would say that sort of a, a more sophisticated approach maybe would be to think really carefully about your seed treatments that you wanna compare and try to make them very similar. Like maybe they're all certified seed, but they differ in just very key characteristics. So maybe maybe you make all your products certified seed, but they have, uh, they have different uh, flesh color, for example. And in that way you can exclude those other variables like certification. And you can see if there's a difference in bids based on just that key quality that you're interested in. It could, it could also be, for example, the source of the seed 
Is it coming from a big seed seller or a small seed seller? Is it coming from a seed seller people know or someone they don't know? Examples. Okay, we've got a, a couple of questions and a, and a minute to go. <clears throat> but uh, Jean-Claude uh, Jean Shimiyamana asks, what are the key points to consider for minimizing the negative influences caused by some people in group auctions? Yeah, so in the uh, in any group auction, you 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 are faced with this issue. Um, so you'll have no matter what sample of people you pick, eventually you're going to have some people that are going to place crazy bids. Um, and this is one of the reasons we like to use um, for this for the this type of experimental auction. Um, sealed bids are quite nice. So. You remember in one slide I mentioned that we were using, we were going to talk mostly about silent sealed bids. So in this case, people can't see what each other are bidding until after the auction is over. And the silent part is quite important. They can't talk to each other. So that's one way in which you try to minimize these negative influences. You, as much as possible, prevent people from talking to each other. So in the auctions, we do a lot of joking and say, no cheating, don't talk to your neighbor, you know, we'll, we'll throw you out of here. It's kind of jokes that, that encourage people to, to really give their own perception and not to chat with each other and conspire. And that, there's actually a lot of writing about that too, strategies for conspiracy in auctions, how, how people can try to get together and, and rig the result. Um, one thing that I didn't talk about in this presentation um, it's very popular to use what we call second price or third price or fourth price auctions. And what that means is that the winner doesn't pay the top price, they pay the second highest price. And there are some statistical reasons why it's, it's been proven pretty well that when you do that, you reduce people's tendency to bid very high or extremely low. So you can use this type of strategy to make sure that people are giving more realistic bids. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much, Eric. Um, you've got some more provocative questions uh, that have just come in, but unfortunately we're, we're out of time. So perhaps you might have a chance to respond to those in writing. Thank you all so much for joining us. We'll see you the same time tomorrow for our last session of the Toolbox Seminar.